Um, we're a publicly traded company listed under the symbol CAPR, and this is your standard forward-looking statement slide. So Capricorn's mission is to bring innovative cell and exosome-based therapies to treat rare diseases. Um, our focus at this time and our cell therapy product is on Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And I'm going to walk you through that program briefly today, but spend the bulk of my time talking to you about our exosomes, which we feel is the next generation in regenerative medicine. And perhaps uh, we're paving the way in, in a revolution in the biotech space in terms of therapeutic development. Shown on this slide is, you know, your typical pipeline slide. CAP-1002 is our cell therapy product. It's been in the clinic for um, many years now. Uh, we started uh, treating adult heart disease and have since moved into rare diseases, focusing on the cardiomyopathies and now the skeletal myopathies. It's a cardiac progenitor cell that's isolated and grown up using proprietary methods in our labs. And you'll see as we move forward, it's very different than other types of cells. It's not a stem cell. It doesn't focus like a stem cell. It actually works as a local drug delivery system, delivering the payload of exosomes, which ultimately leads to um, immunomodulation, reduction in fibrosis, and then uh, stimulating cells to go back into the cell cycle to make new healthy muscle. And then CAP2003 is our exosome product. It's a product that is made from the cell. So these are the exosomes that are now considered to be the API of our cell product. And you'll see that not only is it a product itself, which will be coming into the clinic um, in short order, but it also now serves as a potency assay platform for our cell therapy product. So Duchenne muscular dystrophy is an X-linked disorder. Um, it is uh, primarily in boys and young men uh, due to the fact that it comes from their mothers. It's typically diagnosed around three years of age, so it's not uncommon that a family might have two boys that are affected. It's a rare disease, one in 3,600 births, 20,000 patients approximately in the United States, 200,000 worldwide. Um, with its rare disease um, and with us being in the therapeutic development space, uh, we have several benefits. Uh, we have qualified for a rare pediatric disease coupon upon commercialization um, of this product. Uh, we have um, orphan disease designation. And um, most importantly, and what's driving our program forward really at a great speed, is RMAT, the Regenerative Medicine Advanced Therapy designation um, that came as part of the 21st Century Cures Act. And I don't have to explain that to anybody in this room because either you have it or you want it. So, you know, Duchenne muscular dystrophy is um, one of those diseases that was very much unheralded um, until recently. And it's uh, to the kudos of the families of these boys and young men with this uh, tragic and, and devastating disease where they lose milestones um, throughout their lives rather than gain them and, and typically um, expire sometime in their 20s, um, which has been extended uh, enormously, actually, by the use of steroids. Um, but what's really exciting now in the field of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and you just have seen it and heard it um, from several other companies, is that there's now opportunities for disease-modifying activity um, using gene therapy. That doesn't mean that this disease is cured. What it means is that we can modify it. Uh, there's still room in the toolbox for other therapeutics, and I think we know from our time in, in this field that uh, it takes more than, than one therapy to cure uh, genetic disease. And so what CAP-1002 does and the way that we fit in there um, is that we um, are going to be working and believed to be working adjunctively with the cell therapy, with the gene therapies. Um, how does that work? Uh, you still have a tremendous amount of inflammation, and we know that the cells are immunomodulated modulatory. We have targeted older patients, those with advanced disease, where we're not even sure that the gene therapies can actually work well. So it's possible that um, they may not even be candidates for gene therapy, at least in the short term. Now we give them an opportunity. And as you'll see in my next slide, we have clinical data to support that. So um, I'm taking you through a fast journey on HOPE and, and our Duchenne program because I want to spend, as I said, some time on the exosomes um, and sort of talk to you about what I think is the latest and greatest. But what you see here is the proof of concept in humans data from our phase one to HOPE Duchenne clinical trial. 
Our patients were older. Um, we targeted those that had cardiomyopathy that was established, um, which meant that 80% of our patients were already non-ambulant. That means that they were dependent on a wheelchair for most of their daily activities, so they couldn't do uh, the six-minute walk test. What we found in the study was um, really potentially game-changing uh, for these patients, which is um, not only did we see cardiovascular benefits uh, with a reduction in the amount of scar, um, I don't show it here uh, for purposes of brevity, but uh, we also saw improvements in measures of cardiac function uh, called systolic thickening, which is very important and can be measured by MRI um, and determines a, sort of the functional ability to pump blood to the body. What we also saw and really became game-changing in our ability to uh, develop the therapeutic in the space was we also saw skeletal muscle activity. So we selected a validated measure called the performance of the upper limb. Um, it's the ability to move the shoulders, the arms, and the hands. Um, it actually is uh, one of the most important important measures of function for these boys and young men. Uh, these guys, these older guys, have been off their feet for a long time, but their arms and hands are their key to independence. It means they can move their wheelchairs. It means that they can eat, drink, use the restroom, and provide self-care, which for a boy from 15 years of age and older is uh, the ticket to uh, their success. Um, and then what we also saw is that um, we saw persistent beneficial effects out to a year, although what we've decided to do, and you can see just uh, by looking at the red uh, bars which show um, the functional effect of the cell-treated patients versus the blue, which are the control patients, we see the greatest effect at three months, so in HOPE2, which is the clinical trial that we're um, enrolling now and we think will be um, potentially our registration trial. Uh, we're going to be treating the patients um, every three months intravenously um, with a higher dose of cells. So we can drive the dose higher um, as we're putting it intravenously instead of as we've done traditionally uh, using intracoronary delivery. Um, it's an 84 patient, uh, sort of bells and whistles trial, randomized, double blind, placebo controlled. Uh, 15 um, sites in the US were using um, uh, Care Duchenne uh, certified sites, um, so they are, um, you know, very uh, well-run, well-managed sites to treat Duchenne muscular dystrophy patients. And I will tell you that um, we already have a waiting list of many patients uh, to come into this trial. Um, the patients that are uh, qualifying for this trial, those that are older, really don't uh, qualify for other clinical trials. Uh, one of our site PIs told us recently they have 14 trials in this space and only one uh, to which the older boys can get into, and that's this one. Uh, so we expect that we'll be able to enroll it relatively rapidly. Uh, we expect fully enrolled by next summer, um, 2019, data out a year later, mid-2020, and um, if the ducks align and we have um, efficacy, we expect to submit a BLA in short order after that. So a, a commercial product um, in a pretty uh, few short years. So as promised, um, I'm going to spend the rest of my time, and I can't see my timer here because I'm tiny, um, but um, I hope I have time to take you through the story, and, and I'm going to encourage you now uh, to fasten your seatbelts because this is a bumpy data ride. Um, and I'm not going to walk you through the data very specifically, but what I'm going to do is show you the promise of this product. So how do we discover the exosomes? So we discovered the exosomes because we knew a long time ago that our cells didn't work by stemness, right? They didn't integrate in. They didn't become part of an injured tissue. Um, we saw these paracrine effects, but the paracrine effects um, were uh, persistent well long after um, the cells themselves had died and gone away. We worked in autologous cells, and we worked in allogeneic cells, and we still saw beneficial effects uh, preclinically as well as clinically out to a year later. So there had to be something else that was going on that was providing cellular modifications uh, a long way into the future. And so uh, we did um, what we do best, which is we went back and, and looked preclinically um, to determine uh, what was causing this beneficial effect. And we discovered that our cells, along with um, every other cell, let me just say, um, makes exosomes. And um, exosomes are nanometer-sized lipid bilayer vesicles um, that are packed with RNAs, DNAs, and proteins. And they are cellular messengers. So they're how cells communicate with one another. And now that we and others have discovered them, it's sort of like that, you know, um, light bulb coming on moment where you see, of course, cells have to be able to communicate messages. Of course, they have to be able to tell each other what's going on. It's how they can change behavior. They typically work transcriptionally, translationally, and post-translationally, so they don't integrate in. They don't become, you know, part of the genome. Um, they change cell behavior, not cell identity. 
Um, we identified the fact that our exosomes were mediating the beneficial effects of the cells by putting it into a standard mouse model that we've been using in the lab since I was a grad student, which was a really long time ago. Um, and we were able to show that the exosomes uh, not only caused the beneficial effect in this mouse model of MI, but they did it better um, than an MSC exosome or a um, human uh, fibroblast exosome. And if we brought blocked exosome production um, in the cells using a ceramide inhibitor, we were able to completely abrogate the effect. So we knew that the exosomes um, were uh, actually the API, the, the reason that these cells have an MOA. Okay, so as promised, here comes the heavy data. So the first thing that we did is we looked for what actually are the exosomes doing? How are they mediating this beneficial effect that we've seen in clinical and preclinical models? And what we found is that they have a direct and marked effect on the macrophage. And as I mentioned, um, these assays now serve not only to demonstrate the biologic activity of the exosome, but you can also see from the bar chart shown here on the right, that we're now able also to use this assay to determine the potency of our cells. So we can take a cell bank and we can put it through this very simple assay. And if the exosomes um, are taken up rapidly by the macrophages, then we in fact have um, a correlation with potency. Those that are sort of not so interested in, in uh, being taken up by the macrophages or go away um, represent a non-potent cell bank. So this is a, a very important indicator and also represents the profound immunomodulatory activity of the exosomes. I don't have time today to tell you what that is, but if you find me, I promise I will explain the difference between anti-inflammatory versus immunomodulatory activity. Um, okay, this is getting even deeper into the uh, data weeds, but this is actually one of um, my proudest moments um, with my team um, because we've had some very talented people identify three microRNAs that correlate directly with cellular potency. And we know what these microRNAs are, um, and we know that um, when they go up, we've got a potent cell bank in two cases, and when they go down, um, we have a potent cell bank in the other case. And so this taken together with the macrophages is very important in identifying the potency of the cells as well as really being able to fine-tune the biologic activity of the exosomes. Now, before any of you ask me, okay, Linda, why aren't you taking out those microRNAs and using them as a therapeutic on their own? It's because why not use the package that nature provided? And that's uh, what we're focusing on is delivering the whole exosome and just letting nature do its best job. And then finally, um, our exosomes, the CDC exosomes, are different from MSC exosomes. You can see that in the heat map shown on the upper left, which shows that uh, the microRNAs that are expressed uh, by the CDC exosomes are markedly different from the MSC exosomes. Um, MSC exosomes have a lot of transfer RNA in them. CDC exosomes don't. We have um, a proportion of these non-coding RNAs and Y RNAs that are unique. We actually know what many of them are. And they seem to mediate a different biologic effect than the MSC exosomes, and time and time again when we compare them in the same assay system, ours seem to be better in terms of immunomodulation and the antifibrotic activity. Um, and so, you know, we are um, very excited to be able to take all of this information and deploy the exosomes as a uh, potential clinical program. Now, this data I actually got yesterday. Um, and I'm so excited about it that I wanted to share it with you today. So as I mentioned to you, um, we work in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And um, one of the issues that is of great concern in gene therapy for muscular dystrophy is that the satellite cells don't seem to take up the genes. And we now have data hot off the press from our collaboration with the University of Washington that shows that our exosomes are preferentially taken up by the satellite cells, not only in wild-type mice, but also in the MDX mouse, which is the uh, standard preclinical model. So this suggests the potential opportunity to use the exosomes in Duchenne muscular dystrophy to get to those satellite cells uh, where uh, we haven't been able to get to before. So stay tuned for more data um, and more updates as to where we're taking the exosomes clinically um, I can tell you that uh, they have profound biologic activity, and so um, we are enjoying the, the potential buffet of uh, diseases. It will be a rare disease, and it will be one um, that has uh, no um, uh, therapeutics that are improved in the spaces yet. Okay, so, you know, I just wanted to sort of end this and say that uh, we got into the exosome space a little bit early. Am I over?
22 seconds. I can get through this in 22 seconds. Um, and we are uh, very excited um, to say that we were here early, but the field is getting crowded. Um, I'm a runner, and so I always think in terms of a race, and I feel like we are still at the head of the race, and we're going to keep going. Um, but, you know, I'm also very excited that, you know, as the groundswell continues, um, there's more opportunity to develop the exosomes both as therapeutics, as delivery vehicles, and, and all the other uh, potential opportunities uh, that they provide as the cellular messenger that they are. And I will uh, leave my milestone slide up here so you can see all the exciting things that we're doing and will be doing in the future. And I'll open this up for questions if you have any. And thank you so much for your time today.